Greetings, Broker Cups, and welcome to the Awesome Friday Podcast. Uh, on this week of March the 6th, uh, which is super weird that it's March, uh, I am Matthew, and with me as always is Simon. Say hello, Simon. I just enjoyed your existential crisis. Just before you like, tell us your name, he's like, uh... This is the crisis I'm having with time. Anyway, let's talk yeah. about some films. Yeah, hi. Yeah. It's nice to see you as ever. Yeah, time, time is a flat circle. So <laughs> it really so, is. And it's I just don't weeks. understand how it's how it's March now. Um, I feel like I feel like it's a montage in, a, in an eighties um, detective movie where they they tear off strips of the calendar to show time is passing. That's how I feel like my weeks are going at the moment. Really, I, I feel like it's more like a '40s one where, like, the newspapers spin into view with different <laughs> headlines. <laughs> Maybe uh, if times with, weren't historic, I'd be on your page. But that's where I'm. But at. with with the Batman, like forward and backwards, just to yeah, absolutely. Show the passing. Uh, absolutely. Talking uh, of Batman, talking of Batman, we're not talking about Batman. <laughs> indeed, but, um, we have a supersized episode with three <laughs> new things to talk about, but. Unfortunately, for the time being, one of them is not Batman. Um, we are talking about two things from Disney, uh, one kids thing and one adult thing, and then one drama from A24, which is uh, lovely. Spoiler alert. That's the review. <laughs> that's it. Anyway, it's been nice to see you. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to mention as well that I've not only have I somehow watched all three of these movies in the last seven days, I've also watched... Finally saw the end of Dune, Dune with a J W sound, Dune, and I also watched Night at the Museum Three, uh, Secrets of the Tomb, which is the best Night at the Museum film. We don't have to talk much more about it, but Sean Levy is fast becoming like one of my favorite like family action directors. If you've seen Family Guy, then uh, I haven't seen Real Steel yet. Like as you keep talking, well, you mean about, Free like, Guy? I'm like, why is he talking about Family Guy? That oh, did sense. I say? Sorry, did I say Family Guy? You did, yeah. I, I haven't watched Family Guy in like decades. Why would I say that? So Free Guy, it's very, very good. Night at the Museum Three is excellent. Night at the Museum Two is terrible. Um, but uh, Sean Levy, great action movie. And in Night at the Museum Three, he really, really gets his Indiana Jones on as well. And you can. It's tell funny because we've been. We've been talking about doing a series of episodes of this podcast called Simon, I Told You So. And uh, Real so Steel many. is already on that list. So we should probably so watch it. On list. Yes. So many it's, films on that list. Real, Real Steel is not streaming anywhere on anything, weirdly. Well, that's interesting. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't, it was, I but I guess it's, you know, yeah. those things. Yeah, you know, licensing we, and rights are a whole other conversation. We don't, uh, we, we don't own anything anymore. We just hope that the streaming gods gives us stuff sometimes. Well, we have the illusion of ownership with digital purchases. <laughs> but let's not go down that road. Um, but no, it's been uh, it's been good. It's very right. interesting having kids now. My eleven and seven year old kids are now completely dictating. The kind of thing you watch in the evening. So we're watching lots of family movies, but we've started to progress into things where there's a bit more stress and tension. So um, the kind of things that I watched a lot, like The Goonies and Flash Gordon and United the Museums, and um, my daughter usually cries. Um, she bawled at the end of Night of the Museum more than I've seen her cry at any other movie. And it wasn't even particularly sad. It was just like an ending. She's very, she's an emotional girl. But it's nice. It's nice <laughs> that we can move into these uh, more interesting films now. We've moved away from the really safe family stuff. So it's good. Well, it's a good time to move into Star Trek. I'm just saying. Uh, uh, they love Star Trek. So you, Especially you with, been... uh, uh, this is uh, it's, it's a notable week. This is the only the second double Star Trek week. I think in like decades or something like that, because this week we got a new episode of Discovery and the first episode of season two of Picard. It's amazing. How is Picard? It's a mixed bag. Um, I, I, that's a whole other episode. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. uh, um, it's generally good, but it's a mixed bag, uh, which is pretty pretty standard of I would say. Discovery is kind of the same way, where it has some really great episodes. And some not so great episodes. Um, I just wasn't a huge fan of the sort of overreaching story 
uh, sorry, the overreaching story of the first season of Picard was pretty good. Um, I didn't really like the resolution for some of the characters. But that being said, I kind of like where they all are at the beginning of season two. So I have high hopes. Uh, and if nothing else, they're throwing a ton of money at all these shows. So they look great. And there's, you know, we're in a golden age of Star Trek. There's going to be five Star Trek shows this year. So, yeah. Yeah. My my kids watched Prodigy. We all watched Prodigy and loved it. And that's their, that's the first time they've really watched anything Star Trek. And then uh, because of a little other thing we've got up our sleeves, we've started watching the um, OG series. And uh, they really like it. They like trying to work out who's about to die. And so <laughs> they, they, um, they started recognizing actors who like reappear. So they're like, oh no, they're fine. <laughs> it's like, he's that guy. We've never seen him before. He's, he's absolutely dead. <laughs> Just remember, he's, the easiest tell in the original series is what, what color their shirt is. Well, and the, in the episodes we've seen, there have been people in red shirts who don't die. And the people who have died have been in golden shirts. So it's very confusing. That's true. So, that's uh, true. But that's fun. I think my my son definitely likes Star Trek more than Star Wars, and my daughter's kind of like she's got room for both. But um, turns out my wife is a huge Trekkie as well. I had no idea about. So uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm the last true Star Wars fan in this family now. I mean, you might be, you might be. <laughs> I'm I'm so, happy about it, so don't don't yeah, yeah. Me from me. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. You're you're winning. <laughs> Yeah. So what should we talk about first? Uh, well, that seems like a great segue into talking about a kid's movie, since we were talking about kids liking things. Yes. Uh, so let's start with uh, Turning Red, which is a new, the newest Pixar film, which will be airing on... Uh, it's getting a very limited release, I think, in Hollywood, uh, in theaters, but it's going straight to Disney Plus for the rest of the world. Um and uh yeah it's about a young uh asian canadian woman who turns into a giant panda i say woman but she's like 13 in the movie a girl she's an asian canadian girl who when she gets emotional turns into a giant red panda and it is adorable um (laughs) yeah i mean i don't know what what else to say about this movie that wouldn't kind of spoil something it's just kind of a problem but uh i don't know what what you you're the one with kids what what did you what did you think of the movie um uh well my kids gonna love it first of all because the we were you kind of texted me as as uh, i was watching it just saying how good the animation was and and it's it's kind of easy to um uh get not blase but kind of assume that pixar's always going to be good because pixar don't really make bad films even when their films aren't like stellar they're not bad in terms of quality and the, the animation in this movie is crazy. And honestly, I think you can see the influence of Spider-Verse as well, because there's a mix of, it's got a, a really nice kind of unhinged quality to it. Mm-hmm. It's very, very fast and very dynamic. And there's a really nice mix of solid line drawing mixed in with the 3D CG as well. And so there are, particularly towards the end, some nice um, Spider-Verse influences. I think that movie actually is going to be hugely massively influential on animation going forward as it has been already and what, i mean yeah it definitely I, it definitely has been already i yeah. i also really like that it it's not afraid to be animation in the same way like mm-hmm. there's definitely you know the character models are all just so but then whenever anyone needs to like emote they get like big shiny eyes out of anime and when they need to yeah when there's some action, there's a lot of uh, blur out of other different types of it. Like they really are just not afraid to mix it up a little bit more, which is uh, in the style. Yeah. But then also, the detail is just incredible. Um, yeah. I mean, I know that Pixar finally nailed hair with The Incredibles, which was what like a decade and change ago. But the mm-hmm. the ind- you can see individual hairs on the giant red panda, which is mm-hmm. just incredible. Yeah, and the, I really liked how. It, the story it told was really embedded in like, this Chinese culture, but this is a family who have immigrated to uh, Toronto. Toronto, right? yeah. No, I was going to say, one of my so, favorite things, and this is the director of this, who's, uh, I should probably know, but I blanked on it like I always do. Um, she, um, she's an Academy Award winner. Uh, she won the Best Short Film Academy Award for 
Bow, which is a delightful little short oh, film. You should definitely no look that up. No way. I had no um, idea it was the same director. Yeah, Domi Shi. And she's also the uh, she's the first woman to helm a Pixar film solo. Uh, oh. And it's also Pixar's first film set in and predominantly Canadian, which I also was going to oh, point yeah. out because um, this film is, you know, it's centered in Chinese Canadian, Chinese culture, very much so, but also it's very Canadian. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, not it only really is. not yeah. only because of all the like stuff in in Toronto that you can see. Uh, everything from like it was a pretty climactic part at the Sky Dome and the CN Towers in the background all the time. But then there's just very Canadian like road signs and there's very there's Canadian money all over the place and lots of other uh, small Canadian touches that if you're from here or specifically if you're from Toronto, I think that you will appreciate. Mm. And also starring, you know, Canadian national treasure Sandra Oh, as mm-hmm. uh, as the the main girl's mother. Mm-hmm. The uh, so that mix of cultures I really really liked um, of trying to balance this this young girl like May's a Canadian but with this massive Chinese heritage and she's trying to be the perfect daughter and the perfect student whilst hitting thirteen and noticing that her her mind is changing and very specifically her body is changing and of course this whole movie is a metaphor for female puberty (laughs) and i never Mm -hmm. thought i'd say that sentence like it is very specifically a movie about the body how the body changes at that age the stress of it if you're a female the things to learn how to control the the importance of friend groups the importance of being independent within your family unit as well uh, there's a lot going on in it but it is yeah self-acceptance it's, as well that's about yeah, um, yeah accepting accepting yourself messy parts and all yeah. um yeah yeah it's yeah. funny we, we, we haven't even really talked about the, the plot either which you know i think i think you covered it well like the if we were to say anything more than girl discovers she turns into a giant red panda when she's angry Yep. I think would be doing a disservice to anyone who goes to watch it because there's not much more you need to know, but there are, there are certain elements of the story that you are very unlikely to predict and fit really, really, really well into the narrative that's being told and her with mm. her group of friends. And I, by the way, as a side note, I love her group of friends. I'm watching a lot of things at the moment, which are about the importance of, female friend groups supporting each other like i'm watching um that series dollface on crave with uh cat dennings mm-hmm. which is i don't know if you've seen it but it's uh a girl who breaks up and realizes she's neglected all her friends for years and she re- like trying to re-establish her girl friends and so the whole thing is about the importance of having girl friend groups it just feels really warm and smudgy and so I love May's like friends in this and they're all crazy over this boy band as well. And uh, it just feels really authentic. I, again, it's a, uh, I, lo- I alluded to this in my fresh article that I wrote this week that you've got a, a female director writing about female feelings in a female uh, friend group from a female perspective. And I think that gives you this authenticity that it just feels really, really real and yeah. not cliched or over the top. But I, I have to say, I love the the last act of this, I thought was fantastic. It really dials up where how you could resolve this. I think they could have resolved it uh, in a far more straightforward way, but they at some point decided, no, we're just going to go really big with this. <laughs> like really, <laughs> just we're just going to go huge and drive these points home. And I just thought it really stuck the landing. Like it was such an ambitious last act. And I thought it was fantastic. And it kind of answered all the questions and found resolution to everything, including her being part of her own family as well. It didn't end with her like rejecting any of her culture, more like finding her place in it. And that really hit home for me. It was lovely. Yeah. Finding her place in it and finding balance between it and who she's becoming and, you know, some, resolution for the other characters as well mm-hmm. uh and it, like it's, I, I find that we're kind of unfair to pixar in the same way that we're unfair to spielberg in that 
Pixar never really makes a bad movie. And Spiel, uh, to be fair, I would I would put Spielberg's overall quality higher than Pixar's generally. Mm-hmm. But like they never really make a bad one. And so when they make one that's just fine or really like really quite good, but not an outright masterpiece. Like this, like I would say this one is not quite like the outright masterpiece level of some of their previous efforts. And with Luca last year as well. But if it's not an outright masterpiece, we're like, oh, they didn't make a masterpiece. <laughs> like, mm. And it's the same oh with God. Spielberg. Like that dude cranks out amazing films mm. every year. And unless it's like some genre defying, you know, best picture you've ever seen, people are like, well, it's it's Spielberg. So, yeah. you know, whereas if you just swapped in any other director, you'd be like, I that is the my new favorite director. Mm. And with Pixar, if you swipe, swapped in that it was any other animation studio, you'd be like, oh, they're the new Pixar. <laughs> like, yeah. It's weird how we, they have such a high bar to cross compared to say, I don't know, even DreamWorks, which has a pretty high hit rate too. Mm-hmm. Luke is a really interesting comparison actually, because in a similar way to Turning Red, I actually wasn't on board at the beginning. So for the first part of Turning Red, I was actually really, uh, I really dislike the character models, like mm-hmm. the design of the characters. It, do you know what it reminded me of? And I'm I, this is probably sacrilege to a North American person, but it really reminded me of Peanuts, of Charlie Brown and Peanuts, with the the round like the the round kind of um, disproportionately faces large heads and 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 very large mouths. It just reminded me of like Lucy shouting in Peanuts, and I've never liked Peanuts, and so that was stuck in my head for a long time. But like Luca, and at the, like at the beginning of Luca, I, I didn't think it was that good. It suddenly it found a point, and suddenly through its creativity and through its story and through its just really clever way it was telling its story, got me on board. And by the end of it, I loved it. I loved Luca, and I really love this at the end of it as well. Mm-hmm. I agree, though. It's not. It's not. When you think of the Pixar masterpieces and you think of Wally, you think of like uh, um, Toy Story, and then on the other end of the scale, you've got things like The Good Dinosaur, which is fine. I mean, Turning Red is much better than The Good Dinosaur, but you... Yeah, the Good Dinosaur is fine. Like, even yeah, Cars. Exactly. Even Cars, Cars which is great. a whole franchise that I think is kind of dumb. Um, they're fine. They're well-made. They're well-performed. You know they're they're not they're not bad, um, but the, because they're not amazing, they're not. Mm-hmm. We're like, oh, it's another disappointing. It's it's disappointing. It's a Pixar disappointment because it's only good. <laughs> it's it's a yeah. it's a weird way we talk about stuff. I would say for me, I think I probably liked it more than you. By the sounds of it, for me, Turning Red is one of the best Pixar's. Like it's up there. It's in the, oh. the top. Five. I mean, I haven't seen anything past Toy Story one. I haven't seen two, three, or four, however many there are. But There's four, the and have... and three is a masterpiece. To be fair, I haven't seen four, but three is a masterpiece. I I heard that three was about um, letting go of your childhood and saying goodbye to childhood things, and I uh, I opted out of that pretty <laughs> pretty hard. <coughs> I don't need to feel that emotion right now. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. Um. But out of the ones I've seen, um, it, the, the thing about Turning Red is that it's very distinct as well. And I had no idea it was by the same director as Bao. It makes perfect sense now because it's got it's definitely got its own style and its own voice for me. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's really good. I don't I wouldn't I don't think I'd put it into the necessarily the top five. But, um, you know, I also don't really think about ranking art as much as I used to when I was a kid so mm. or even when I was 35 so <laughs> <laughs> like there's a reason why my my best of the year posts every year now just have like my favorite and then my other favorites like I yeah, don't yeah. I don't do like one to ten or whatever so I don't think it's fair because I like them all for different reasons you know it's it's mm. uh and it's not a it's also just not a competition so they multiple things can be good at the same time uh, apart from when you watch Batman and then you have to choose which is your best Batman because that's the law, apparently, on Twitter. You have to choose the best Batman and then uh, just keep ducking the Zack Snyder fans when you say it's not Ben Affleck. 
my favorite thing to do on Twitter when Batman comes up is every once in a while, someone will post a, like an image and it'll be an image of like all five or I guess now all six Batmans. And someone will be like, one's got to go. Who is it? And my general response is that's five pictures of the same person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that goes down really well. Yeah, it generally does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've got far more patience on Twitter than I do. Like poking, I also have like the wasp nest. I also have like twenty thousand people blocked, so it's a little <laughs> quieter for me. My favorite thing in recent memory, actually, I think it was a couple of years ago, you poked a particularly virulent Star Trek hive, like talking about Spock or something, and they're all like, rah, 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 and every single you are, and you're like, well, actually, this episode says you're wrong. This episode says you're wrong. <laughs> da, 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 da. Like yeah, don't don't take Matt on in Star Trek. <laughs> don't do that. Yeah, I think I think what I said for that. So what I'm thinking of was that was the time I pointed out that the short treks are really good. Um, <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> I said I said they were like the best the best Star Trek on TV at the time, and a lot of people mm-hmm. didn't like that. And my general response, to, most of my responses, I did have a few pretty pointed responses to people, but my general response to the people who were complaining about it were like, "Oh, you've never watched Star Trek before." Because they were complaining about like how woke they are and all the like politics and themes that like you just never watched this franchise before, have you? Like you like it doesn't. Yeah, there's no yeah. there's no politics in Star Trek at all. There's never no. been any kind of political like stance there's in Star Trek. Never been any social themes at all ever. <laughs> so. Actually, if I could take anything from Short Treks, it would be Rose Salazar uh, as a captain uh, in her own show, like. Just, uh, is it Rose Salazar who played Ro- Rosa? Rosa, I think. Rose, Rosa Salazar. So yeah. she's in a she's in a really good episode with the guy who inseminates Tribbles or something. <laughs> like he, yeah, he so puts his uh, sperm H. in John, Tribbles. H. John Benjamin. H. John Benjamin. Yeah. Uh, plays a mad scientist who like he doesn't create the Tribbles, but he like ends up supercharging their reproductive system. <laughs> Uh, his own. <laughs> and it uh like it's like a prequel to every other Tribbles appearance. Yeah. And uh it's 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 a really funny episode. It's really good. It's really, really good. Yeah. Um, well that's very much that like turning much red. Like turning red. <laughs> 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 Both trying to rescue at the same time. Um yeah. so um yes, Turning Red uh is out on Friday and you should watch it. And there is um, there's very open, frank discussions of uh, female puberty. It's a theme, and it is it is not hidden in any way, and it's not subtle in any way. And it, that's a good thing. I'm saying this is a good thing. So, but if you're if you're <laughs> if you're watching with somebody who you haven't had that conversation yet, you might want to have that conversation before this movie, because yeah. you'll definitely be having the conversation after this movie. Yeah. Well, what would you what would you give it out of uh, out of five? I'd say four. It's a four star movie for me. Yeah, I am gonna say three. I think that <laughs> if if I was still giving half marks, I would give it a three and a half. But mm-hmm. it's just a really high three for me. Yep. Which isn't That's to right. say that it's bad. Again, it's just it's it's quite good. It just didn't mm-hmm. it didn't. I didn't really connect with it in the same way that I've connected with some of their past work. Yeah. Uh, and that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, so shall we move Good. on to yes. uh, another female centric film? Yes. Let's talk about this one. So this I'm is also from excited. Disney. Uh, Fresh <clears throat> starring Daisy Edgar Jones and Sebastian Stan is actually already out. It came out this past Friday. Uh, it debuted on Disney Plus Star here in Canada and Hulu in the United States. It was a huge hit at Sundance, and it's called Fresh. And Simon, you seem to have loved this one, so I'm going to let you yeah. give the synopsis. Because uh, <clears throat> there's definitely a certain point at the which you can you can talk about yeah. the plot of this film up to a point. I'm going to uh, tell my, you about the. My yeah. advice really would be to that. We both like it, and you should maybe skip this part and just watch it as cold as possible. Uh, yeah, I think we'll have to give some things away to discuss it. Um, I tried not to really go into anything in my article, but the the premise of this movie, I will tell you about this movie up until the credits, up until the, the title card of this movie, which is a girl is dating 
and it's going pretty bad because the people she meets are terrible, as in just boring and um, very very basic men who it's, comment it's on, a, on her. It's a pretty accurate depiction of dating, I would say. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I gather. I'm very glad not to be in doing that anymore. And um, she randomly meets a guy in the supermarket, Sebastian Stan, who is uh, rather awkward but kind of handsome, and he uh, he wins her over by being just kind of awkwardly charming and not being too sort of doesn't really pressure in any direction, and so she. Uh, she meets up with him for a drink and she really likes him and they, he really likes her and they get on really, really well. And she freely admits that she hates dating. She hates the, the questions. She hates the texting. And yet she, she really likes like what's happening with them. And they, they form a physical relationship very, very quickly. And, um, and then he was like, we should get away for the weekend. We should go. I, I've got this place. We should go and just get away for the weekend. And she is kind of head over, like falling for him pretty quickly. And she says, yes, not naively, but kind of, it seems like a, when you watch the movie, it doesn't seem like a stupid thing to do. Um, <clears throat> and that's all I'm going to tell you about the movie. <laughs> but mm-hmm. see, when they get when they get to where they're going, the movie has been lying to you uh, up to that point. And then the movie and the character tells you the truth. And then you get the titles 30 minutes in and it's, um, it's not the movie that you expect it to be. At yeah. all. The title card comes at the 32 minute mark. If I remember, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. And from that point on, it is the movie that it wants to be. And I don't want to give any of it away at all. I'm still going to say that you should go into this film as cold as possible. But if I would say that even if you have an idea in your head what what it's going to be, from what we're saying, it's not exactly that. Like the things you're probably thinking of, it's, it's not exactly that either. Uh, I, like about, in, about... Su- in some in some ways, it like it is very much. It does become a bit of a revenge thriller, but not in the way or for the things you're expecting. And that's I... about as vague as I can be. Yeah, I texted Matt about. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, just after the type cards, maybe ten minutes or so, talking about one of my favorite genres is woman trapped and has to do something about it trapped in a situation or trapped in a place i love bottle movies anyway but i I like give me a give me a strong woman fighting back against an asshole man and i'm happy basically and um i texted matt and i think we talked about how much i love the genre and at that point i was saying i i i expect everything i expect to happen is happening and i'll be quite happy if it does something i don't expect that i haven't seen before and by the end of the movie, uh, the last 30 minutes of this movie, my heart was basically trying to burst out of my chest. It, and I, I, it did that. It definitely found ways to shock me and play around with the what's expected in this, um, in this kind of genre. I think we're going to have to talk more about it now, aren't we, in order to discuss it. There's not much more we can say without giving away what the movie actually is. And yeah, honestly, and I don't, if, if you I don't pay, really want to if, do that, but okay. Um, what I will say though is that, I mean, both Daisy Edgar Jones and Sebastian Stan are really pretty phenomenal in the yeah. movie. Um, I know that uh, there's sort of a thing that goes around social media, especially you know, Sebastian Stan is a very handsome man who, with his main thing that he's known for, which is playing. Uh, Bucky in the Marvel movies is that it's a pretty pretty boring character, um, but it turns out <laughs> that uh, he's actually a really good actor. Uh, which, if you've seen him in other things, you will know. But it's weird to me that he's sort of most famous for his most I hate to say it, but his most boring role. Yeah, um I, I, because he's really good he's a really dynamic performer he really goes all in especially when when the film asks him to be like weird or menacing 
or creepy. He's really good at going all in and he's really good at turning up the charm too. And the sort of like quiet brooding depressed character that he plays in the Marvel movies is doesn't, doesn't really like, I don't think it's his fault. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, and uh, Daisy Edgar Jones, who, as I understand it, she's in the War of the Worlds series that you quite like, right? Is that right? Yeah, the the remake of War of the Worlds. She's <clears throat> she plays a a blind girl who gets her sight back, and um, when the aliens attack, and it it's a it's a very bleak and gritty reimagining of War of the Worlds, and she is fantastic in it. I yeah. I love her as a performer. And I only know her from the main thing I know her from is she was in that uh, BBC ordinary people I, Irish uh, show called Normal People, in which she's also mm-hmm. just phenomenal. Um, mm. And I'm really glad that both her and the the guy in that are starting to get noticed, recognized, and out there. Yeah, you're right about Sebastian Stan. Like I I hadn't seen him in anything outside of MCU, and so like you say. I I hadn't thought he was anything more than quite a boring character. I'd, so you attach that to the actor, but he is phenomenal in this. And it's interesting that both his character and Daisy Edgar Jones's Noah, um, they kind of they go through a lot. They go through a wide spectrum of re- actions and reactions, uh, showing their true colors in order to achieve what they want and. They're both like phenomenal. Like Daisy Edgar Jones's eyes could stop traffic. Like, and there's a couple of moments where they're directed to look directly through the camera at the viewer, and it is just like heart stopping. It's incredible. And the whole the whole direction is fantastic as well. The whole movie, it's so good. Yeah, it turns out Mimi Cave uh, has the goods, <clears throat> as it were. Um, there's a lot of really interesting directorial choices. A lot of really interesting camera work. Uh, Mm-hmm. a lot of really interesting ways the camera chooses to follow people and things uh, in various scenes that give things uh, so hard to speak so vaguely, <laughs> but to, that give mm-hmm. certain scenes more, uh, more impact. Mm-hmm. Um, and the supporting cast is quite good. I really liked uh, Jonica T. Gibbs as the best friend, Molly. Um, mm-hmm. And the, uh, what's her name? The uh, the there's another female character played by Charlotte Lebon, who uh, shows up toward the end of the film, who's also quite good. Uh, it's mm-hmm. also I don't know if you noticed uh, this is very clearly shot here in Vancouver. But, uh, oh, is it? I thought it was. Yeah the uh, the I... bar they the bar they meet at is the Clue Club, which is just in Gastown. Oh. Um. <clears throat> so yeah, as uh, there's a lot of a lot of these supporting players are Canadian, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Um, but yeah, I mean overall, it's a. Uh, it's I hate I hate uh, it. Su- it sucks. It's great this week that we have an oversized episode because we're dropping this one a day later than normal. But it also sucks in that we have three films that telling you too much about would would r- not ruin them, but definitely lessen the impact thereof you know it's mm-hmm. it's difficult to speak so vaguely about so many things <laughs> i will say that we won't give away what it's really about but in the first 30 minutes there are some very clear um clues from camera angles and, and what the camera focuses on and they they stick out initially and when you learn what the film is actually about you realize why they were there. And I think it would really reward a second viewing because I'm sure there's more that I probably missed of some clues about where everything is going. And what I love about this film is that, again, it's full of little details that I think are really, really authentic from a female perspective. And the whole thing is about abuse anyway. And it feels a very accurate kind of reaction to male abuse from a a number of different angles there's a really interesting choice at the end as well and to show us that the the abuse can can go full circle sometimes and turn into like a situation you can't escape from anyway but the, the there's certain things that noah noah decides to 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 um survive noah makes a decision 
And that decision is so shocking <laughs> that as a viewer, I my jaw was open like for a lot of this. And <laughs> da- Daisy Edgar Jones does this thing where she she somehow keeps up the pretense of doing the thing, but also shows us how hard it is to do the thing. Like, and it's all so subtle. The camera does not jump around as well. So technically the camera really supports the performers, but the, they are both like Sebastian Stan's doing great work as well. I never thought I'd say that sentence. He's fantastic in this. And he is showing us this like conflict he's feeling for a number of reasons. He's, he's overstepped his usual limits and he's feeling his way around that. And Noah, Daisy Edgar Jones is showing us this incredible journey and you're just waiting and waiting for this, the hammer to drop. And it's, um, it's so effective and it's all, the, the cast is great. And, and the chemistry between the leads is fantastic as well. So it's that golden uh, combination of great casting, great direction, great camera work. And it's just one of those really satisfying um, movies in this genre where you know that something is going to have to change, but you don't necessarily predict what's going to change. <laughs> and that makes it even more horrific. <laughs> <laughs> also, oh, too, I really liked, you know, speaking that it's, you know, a lot of really interesting detail from, you know, the female perspective. But one thing I really, and this, I mean, it's not, even necessarily requires a female director. But I think in the beginning, you know, Noah, Daisy Edgar Jones' character has had such a rough time in the dating scene that when she starts really falling for this guy and her best friend is like, that's a red flag. And she's like, it's probably fine. You know, I feel like that's really realistic too, that like she's had such a bad time that she's starting to, and that's not just a female thing. Like we, lots of people, men and women both do that overlook red flags um Mm. and i just i just but i felt it was a really authentic portrayal of that of the best friend being like he doesn't have instagram Mm. that's weird yeah (laughs) like it's uh yeah yeah it's full of details like that that i really appreciated Mm -hmm. and uh yeah i don't know what else i don't want to say that isn't that isn't a spoiler i i'm interested there's there's one character whose arc um, as a support character seems to be playing off a certain way and then their arc just suddenly stops. Do you know who I'm talking about? The uh, I, uh, I think there's, what... there's at least three people I can think of that that would fit. <laughs> <laughs> so Mimi Cave gives us perhaps a saviour figure um, and then just removes that from the equation just instantly and quickly. And yeah, I know who you're talking about. Part, part, part of me is like, well, okay, that's a clever directorial choice to sort of subvert our expectations. But on the other hand, it kind of feels a little unresolved that so much time is spent on that journey. But again, these are expectations as well. I don't know which would be better. I don't know which would be better as if there was some involvement from that character in the climax Rather so assuming, zero. assuming for the moment that we're both talking about the same character, which um, yeah, I'm just gonna pause very quickly. Uh, so the um, I think it a it's a pretty good expectation subversion. I think you're right there, mm-hmm. but I also think that maybe it's fairly realistic that when that character shows up and in the moment when he could be the savior goes, uh, no, <laughs> just leaves. Yeah, I I think that that's actually maybe kind of realistic, um, mm-hmm. but there are there's a couple of there's a few things in the end that bothered me. I think a little bit more than they bothered you. That was not one of them. Um, but there's another character who just disappears entirely. Like doesn't mm-hmm. it's not like an active choice. They just like kind of the movie kind of yeah. forgets that they're there. Um, yeah. but the movie also ends kind of abruptly. So you know there's room mm-hmm. for your imagination to run wild with what, what might happen next. Yeah, I, I thought a lot about the end of this movie in how perhaps I would have changed the climax. And I've got some ideas which we'll talk about off air another time, but I, I'm not convinced 
they would be better. <laughs> like resolving well, those, I've I've thought of a way of resolve like all the things we've talked about that aren't quite resolved, and I I don't know I don't know if it will be better. <laughs> and I just think everything I can not every I mean I have done the same thing, and I don't think anything necessarily would be better, maybe may different. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I think the movie's mm-hmm. pretty great how it is. Mm-hmm. So. And I think is, again, yeah. I think that the uh, the way that those characters' stories all resolve, and again, there's there's three, two prominent and one not that that have arcs that just sort of uh, stop in places, mm. and um, I I lost my train of thought. <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> there's there's three characters who have their arcs just sort of stop, and I and again, I just don't think that they are. I don't think that's necessarily unrealistic choices. Is all. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I absolutely. Yeah. And absolutely. this is a movie that that sort of needs to exist in a slightly heightened place, and yet mm-hmm. those choices keep it uh, maybe grounded in a way, keep it closer to reality in a way, among this sort of very heightened universe that it exists in. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Totally. But it's yeah. good. I, I I really enjoyed it. It's one of my favorite films of the year by a long stretch. Um, and I, I even with the loose threads at the end, I felt the ending was really satisfying, um, and had some really good things to say, like beyond the technical expertise on show. And I just adored some of the direction and and the acting, but the the way it wanted the things it wanted to say about acceptance of others or trust in others and abuse and escaping that abuse, I thought it was really really interesting. I loved it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's probably as much as we can say at this yeah. point about this movie. Uh, other than you should watch it. Fresh is already available again on Disney Plus and Hulu, depending where you live. Yeah, and, and it's got this really weird, like, 60s title. Like, uh, um, have you seen it on Disney Plus? It's the font of Fresh makes it look like it's a, a kooky 60s, like, weird yeah. zany comedy it's really not <laughs> it's really yeah. not at all and that font is not in the movie they should have used the title card font because that gives you a much better idea so please Although don't the, be i will say that the uh there are some there were a few moments that are pretty laugh out loud funny really <laughs> oh there's some there's some dark humor in there definitely and some light humor but yeah. um it's not it's not what it looks like <laughs> i think yeah. but you should yeah, you're not it. wrong it's uh, although I will say I, I like the poster, but I, uh, um, yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, sure. Five, five out of style, five stars. Why not? Wow. Five out of five from Simon for fresh yeah. and uh four out of five for me, I would say. Yeah. I mean, I'm completely biased. It's one of my favorite genres and it was done really well. So there that's, go. that's going to, that's gonna I don't do think well you need me. to, yeah, I don't think you need to explain anything if you want to give it a five you, you <laughs> give it a five Woohoo! all right i will uh so, so shall we move on to our third and final yes. film of the episode uh which is the latest film uh and the second film from uh director konagata koganata um mm-hmm. called after yang starring uh colin farrell and uh jody turner smith i think is her name uh and hang on a second i'm just gonna have to bring it up because i keep i keep doing this where uh, i have everything in my I brain have, and then i don't yeah, have it jody up in front turner of me smith, and, I, and i forget justin h ming as yang Haley yeah. Lee richardson's in there and a few other people yeah and for those of you who have seen 2017's columbus which was uh Koganada's first feature film uh he made a name for himself as a film editor and a video essayist uh and he put together some special features some criterion network uh and a few other things like that he's really he's got a really keen visual sense um but he's also got a really keen emotional sense and his 2017 film uh Columbus which was Haley Lou Richardson and John Cho was my favorite film of that year, uh, in large part because it sort of reached into my 
middle section and pulled out some emotions that I hadn't <laughs> really felt like feeling and maybe needed to at the time. And After Yang is another one of those kinds of films. Uh, it star <clears throat> it concerns uh, a family, the patriarch of which is Colin Farrell and his wife, Jody Turner Smith, and their young adopted Chinese daughter. It's set in a it's sort of difficult to say if it's a near or far future, but in a future where they also have a, a fourth family member called Yang, who is a, a quote, techno sapien, who they've hired to help give their adopted Chinese daughter um, a more Chinese experience in life and more Chinese information and to learn the language and all this kind of stuff. Um, they also have a next door neighbor who's played um, by Clifton Collins Jr., who is always excellent. Uh, and he has daughters, three daughters, who are all clones. Uh, and there's a lot to be said about that as well. Um, and they also, uh, ba the basic setup of the movie is that at the very, very beginning, like immediately after the opening credits, Yang breaks down. And... In the course of trying to have him repaired, including a pretty hilariously depressing scene where they take him to an equivalent of the genius bar, <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, God. Yeah. they're able to pull out this memory module and Colin Farrell is able to sort of explore Yang's memories uh, as, as, a, as an existing being. And the rest of the film is really literally pretty much just that. Colin Farrell mm -hmm. exploring the robot, the robot's memories and the whole thing is beautiful and i i don't i don't know what else to even i should need to say to you at this point the whole thing is beautiful um seeing what you know this character thinks is important and it does a lot of really interesting things technically as well the whole thing is shot uh with very sort of static and steady cameras when we're dealing with colin farrell and his family and it's shot in super high resolution video when we're seeing these memories from Yang's point of view. Um, and I, I, I don't know what else to say, man. Like this, this movie is, is, is beautiful on every level and asks mm -hmm. a lot of questions about what is love and how are we connected and what are we connected and who are we connected to? And I, you know, there's definitely, people out there who this might not be for and to be fair um my my wife who has generally very good taste in movies this movie is not the kind of movie that she would like um because it's the the pace is quite uh the best word for the pace of this film is languid it really lets you in the same way that columbus did it really lets you sit in the feelings you're having and that's not for everyone and that's not a judgment um but for me, this is exactly the kind of movie that, you know, if I want to feel a feeling, this is the way I want to feel it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, yeah. It's the kind of movie it's... that, again, reaches into your midsection and pulls something out and shows it to you, and then you end up sobbing. It's one of those stories, there's so much going on in it. It's, it's mainly about what, what makes something alive. <laughs> like, what is the yeah. meaning of life? That's all this movie is about is... What is a soul? How how do we define alive and dead? Like, what if yeah. something that we define as dead shows to be alive? Like, what then? And and the the there's no real answer. Like it, there is a conclusion to this movie that's incredibly emotional. It hits very deeply, but the the emotional ending of this movie is is a quiet one. There's no like revelatory sequences about afterlife or anything it's just a, an acceptance of something and this i mean you, you you put it really really well like it it really is a movie about colin farrell exploring some something uh, an artificial being slowly becoming a real thing not in a pinocchio sense but through memories through this like memory chip that it was it, it was only meant to record like two second snips of memory. And it's worth saying that the one of my favorite parts of this movie technically is the audio when he's going through the memories, the audio goes from absolute silence to bursting into like 
uh, a country uh, like a garden or like music or and it's loud and then suddenly it stops mm-hmm. and the um Colin Farrell is a fantastic actor and he really really shows us an emotional range here as he tries to sort of follow the trail of these memories and find out who this person was that they've had in their family as a like automaton for years but it turns out he had this whole like previous and alternative life there they knew nothing about and he, he was slowly making his own personality and making his own thoughts and um it's i the, the immediate comparison i had was when i got to the end of cloud atlas the book not necessarily the movie of that like being filling like a balloon this sense of the universe and souls and and, and connecti- connectivity and ideas of life and th- uh, memory uh, and uh, color and of course all of his memories are so interesting because they are some of them are so ordinary like a piece of paper or a tree or something and yet everything is just so stunningly beautiful we're told that he only records things that he feels to be significant. And when we see those significant things are somebody making tea or like a blade of grass in the wind, it makes you start thinking on a much smaller scale about how beautiful things just generally are around you. I it, I sort of laughed a little bit because it's a much more subtle version of American Beauty's like plastic bag in the wind. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It does. It's the same idea, but much, much better than that. And um, just it's also like, not, it's also not necessarily explained directly to you in the same way. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, know, it's, yeah. It's not, you, you know, you e- even though there's a lot more of it, it doesn't beat you over the head with yeah. any of it. Yeah. Yeah. All you need to know is that Yang decided this was beautiful and it's very touching in that way just to see, to go backwards through his life as different layers of this memory core are unlocked for narrative purposes. And just to see that the different layers of this person's life and the time that it goes through, it's, um, it's really nice. And what I really liked is that the, the main sort of two characters, so Colin Farrell and the uh, actress who I hadn't seen before, Jodie Turner Smith, who was really good. Their relationship is is not like the, the they're not quite on the same page at the beginning, but it's a very gentle coming together when they see through Yang's memories, like the kind of couple they are. It just very subtly sort of brings them together at the end, and I really, really love that. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, everything I about know, this I... movie is is subtle is a very good word for everything yeah. about this movie. Colin Farrell shows a huge range of emotion, but it's all incredibly subtle. He has a mm-hmm. very well-defined arc that is very subtle. You know, like mm-hmm. uh, everything Yang does in the movie and every single one of his flashbacks is subtle. The most the most unsubtle thing in the entire movie is one of the flashbacks, one of the memories Colin Farrell stumbles across when he's doing this exploration. And he comes across a memory of himself and Yang as he's making tea. He's a tea seller in the movie. And at one point, Yang says, I wish tea was more than just fun facts for me. Mm-hmm. Because he doesn't really have the same sort of appreciation for it that Colin Farrell does. Uh, or that, mm-hmm. you know, to be a little less subtle that a human might. Um, and that's that's the most unsubtle thing in the whole movie. <laughs> and it's such mm-hmm. a soft moment and such one that it it doesn't speed by because nothing in the movie speeds by but it's over relatively quickly and but it informs also the it's sort of a turning point for how colin farrell perceives yang even though he's already been going through all these memories and the whole thing is just Mm -hmm. i mean yeah it's it's a type of movie that that if you're open to it again will will reach inside you and pull something out Mm -hmm. And that's uh, kind of amazing. So I haven't seen Columbus. So this is the first movie from this director. And I am absolutely uh, fascinated by his directing style. And also, I don't know what Columbus is like, but this is set in some kind of nondescript near future where there's there's lots of different cultural influences. 
sort of mashing together. The production design in this movie is absolutely like stellar. They have redesigned common household objects to fit in their futuristic world, like milk cartons, like mm-hmm. everything. Everything is redesigned and looks uh, normal. It doesn't look like a redesigned thing. It looks like a normal part of that world. It's it's stunning to look at. But what I found really interesting is that there's a couple of um, shot reverse shot conversations where multiple takes of the actors are edited together, mm-hmm. uh, including repeated lines. So you'll often hear repeated lines of dialogue delivered in different ways. And this is pretty normal on set for, for a, a director to ask their actors to give me something different. Like do it again, like find something different with it. And then they'll sort of edit together the one version they want. But it, in this there's multiple conversations where there are repeated lines with different deliveries from the actors. And also it's, it, it's amazing to see these actors give these different versions as well, because um, they're all slightly different. But I, I, I was really fascinated by that, and it was never really explained why that was done in the context of the story. So um, my, re- my read on that, I think it's really interesting too. My read on that is that, it's it's to highlight the um it's the best way to say this it's to highlight the inaccuracy of memory because if you notice all of yang's memories again are in super sharp very wide depth of field hd but there's a lot of memories and flashbacks from especially from colin farrell but also from jody turner smith um and in their memories are shot closer. Their uh, aspect ratio and shooting is a little bit different from the main narrative, but it's a lot closer. And I think that in a lot of the times where you get those like repeated cuts, I think that's them remembering or maybe misremembering how those scenes went down exactly and trying to like explore and reconstruct it in their mind. That was my take on what exactly was going on with those scenes. Or yeah, having like good. or having like their memories being like you know, seeing it through Yang's point of view and then sort of reconstructing their own point of view as the case may be. Mm-hmm. Right. There's, it's most explicit. There's a scene where Jodie Turner-Smith uh, is going through and si- she's sitting at Yang's desk and admiring uh, this collection of things that he has. And she's also at the same time viewing his memory of an interaction they had and remembering the interaction that they had. And so you see mm-hmm. it from multiple points of view. And I think, again, from from multiple ways that she remembers it because memory is at least in humans is not static right like we remember things in different contexts in different ways depending on you know how serious an interaction it was and how we are being remembering it and and why we're remembering it Mm -hmm. and that was my take was that those those multiple different reads were all the different sort of versions of the same thing and again gorgeous I think you're absolutely right, and it really uh, bothers me that I didn't work that out. Um, yeah, you're you're a hundred percent correct. Like Yang's is completely crystal clear, and and all the other the repeated lines are human memories, and that makes total sense. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, uh, but yeah, it was really beautiful to look at, and brilliantly directed and acted. I I. I kind of, I think my emotional reaction to it was different to yours. I kind of felt warm and fuzzy after it. It, it, do you know what it really felt like? It's really stupid. But when I had my son, my son's now 11. And, and, and when the night he was born, I think I've told you this before. I had this moment, my wife was complete fast asleep and it was like three in the morning and I'm holding this baby. And the thing is when you, when you have a baby, they kind of just give you the baby and say, right now you have a baby. There's no like, that's it (laughs) there's no there's no tutorial and i'm i'm very very sensitive person anyway and there's there's certain moments in my life where i've known like this is a crossroad moment like this you can almost feel the universe's gears shift as uh, something big changes and i just remember holding my son and just feeling like the whole universe ahead like uh, around me and 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 how everything was connected. And it's kind of this, this very D 
deep feeling in my heart that I had that that in that moment. And this this film kind of like Cloud Atlas, like I said, made me feel the same thing. Just this warm, fuzzy, like wondrous feeling of everything being connected. And I I cry at everything these days, but I didn't cry it after Yang. When when the girl they've got a young kid when when she starts going through her grief, I can't deal with kids crying for obvious reasons. So that was pretty close for me. But my emotional reaction to this movie was just like, yeah, it's just like that connected feeling of souls. It, it was a really nice feeling to have at the end of this film. Yeah, this movie definitely made me cry. Um, part, it's interesting. Um, I, sorry, I have to collect my thoughts on this. But one thing, so Columbus is not really like this at all. It's set now. It's about two people in a town waiting. Um, but what both films are very much about is um, grief and loss and connection. And uh, they both touched on very personal memories and feelings for me which when it when it comes to this movie i will probably tell you later but i'm not going to talk about it here on the podcast because it's a bit too close still but it, yeah. it, it touches something this film touched something in me that was very personal um mm-hmm. and columbus does the same thing i can speak more freely about columbus and we will whenever we get around to simon i told you so because columbus <laughs> is at the top of that list yeah yeah, it really um, is. Yeah, but Simon, uh, but in Columbus, what both characters are are so the the basic setup of Columbus is that John Cho's father is a famous architect, and he's in Columbus because the city of Columbus is this like mecca for architecture, and he collapses and he ends up in the hospital, and the rest of the film is basically just John Cho and Haley Lou Richardson waiting, mm-hmm. and. I don't know if you've ever had to wait for someone who's effectively on their deathbed, but I have. Mm, mm. And it connected me to those feelings in a way that I <laughs> wasn't necessarily prepared for, but was very grateful for. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a little easier because <laughs> I was like 10 years removed from those feelings. Um, mm. But this movie did that for me again, but for something that was a lot closer. And I'm just not going to talk mm. about it here. So Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I think this movie is so reflective on so many different things. I'm sure everyone's going to see something in it, especially our age. Um, there's there's so many deep themes that are handled so well with so much sensitivity. And it's so interesting to look at as well. And I, I really like how it kind of combined, you mentioned like the Apple Store from Hell at the beginning, like, combined a a comment on our reliance on technology and our treatment of technology as well as whilst talking about the nature of life too so it was it was a very clever metaphor for the whole thing i thought yeah it's a it's a pretty amazing film i think i still like columbus more um but it's certainly one of the best films i've seen this year to date Mm -hmm. um and I'll be shocked if it doesn't end up on my year-end list, to be totally honest. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, of, of the so, three films we watched this week, this is uh, my favorite one, for sure. Okay. So this is a five for you? Uh, it's still a four, but it's just, it is clearly my favorite of the, of the three. Fair enough. Yeah, it's a four from me, too. It's a great yeah. film. Yeah. Really beautiful. Good. Good. So what's coming up next week then? What have we got coming up? Uh, you know, honestly, I don't actually really know. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, uh, we, still, we, still have, we should talk about West Side Story at some point because that's now on uh, Disney Plus. Yeah. I, would love, I haven't seen it yet. I would love to talk about West Side Story. Yeah, you should definitely watch West Side Story. Um, we also have... Uh, Actually, we don't really have anything else coming up uh, explicitly that I could even talk about right now, but uh, it would be a good opportunity to maybe, and because I'll take any opportunity to rewatch original West Side Story, so we could do a make-remake mm-hmm. episode on West Side Story, if you would like. 
Mm, yes, I would. Uh, or we could do a Simon I Told You So on one of those five. <laughs> so many to choose from. That's we true. Could, um, I feel like the the thing that really kicked off the I Told You So list was Creed. So maybe we should go back and talk about Creed. Maybe. You were very, you were very, very right about that movie. <laughs> yeah, you're goddamn right. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, uh, so three films. Well, so um, uh, uh, here's how you can support us, listeners. Indeed, well, apart from listening. Uh, first off, yeah, you can listen and you could uh, follow us on your podcasting platform of choice, uh, or give us a five star review on your podcasting platform of choice. We do have uh, a Patreon, a Patreon. I'm not really actually sure what the right pronunciation of that word is. It's, it's, I, I, I think because you become a patron, so I think it's Patreon, isn't it? But because Patreon sounds a bit like patronizing. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't, don't, I don't, I don't I think know. it's Patreon. Anyway, we have one of those, uh, and you can find a link to that <laughs> on our website at awesomefriday.ca. Um, but either way, we just want to thank you for listening. We love you all. Uh, you know, we normally I would, uh, I've been thinking we should do like a credit sequence for the show, but really the credits <laughs> is that like, it's not written, but is performed by me and Simon and is produced by me. And, uh, we record on the unceded lands of the Musk William Slay with Tooth and, uh, Squamish nations, and that's pretty much it because we don't, we don't, we don't write this ahead of time, so <laughs> um, that's about it. Um, and neither should we, <laughs> neither should we. But that's uh, that's all we got for you this week. Uh, we are this episode is dropping a day later than normal, so you'll see another one in six days from us. Um, and we're looking forward to talking to you then. Sure, are. thank you for listening. See you Woo. soon. Bye. Bye.